Hello, I bid you all a very warm welcome to the launch of our campaign, My Content, My Rights. My name is Alexandra Gese. I'm a member of the European Parliament for the Greens AFA Group, and I'm a co-coordinator together with Patrick Breyer from the Pirates, who are part of our group, of the Digital Working Group of the Greens in the European Parliament. I'm very happy to launch this event. What are we talking about today? We're talking about the Digital Services Act. And the Digital Services Act, as you probably know, is widely suspected to be as, as big or even bigger than the groundbreaking European legislation on data protection called, known as GDPR. Because the DSA, the Digital Services Act, would set rules for online services for the years to come. The Digital Services Act will consist of an update of the e-commerce directive that is up until today providing a safe harbor for intermediaries and has contributed immensely to the development of the internet as we know it. Today, we will focus on one part of the future Digital Services Act, a notice and action mechanism and how strong user rights could look like in this context. The campaign of the Green Zephyr on the DSA that we're launching today is building on two pillars. Firstly, we are highlighting that online platforms often censor perfectly legal content, which often leads to problems, especially for minorities and vulnerable groups. Yes, there are big problems with the distribution of content, such as right-wing extremist calls for violence, discriminatory and hateful comments, against minorities, against women, and so on. And often we hear calls that the platforms are irresponsible and that they don't do enough to delete such content. But our campaign is highlighting that these calls are going into the wrong directions. We don't want private companies to decide unilaterally and intransparently because this leads to even more problems online and too often to the deletion of content of those same minorities that are being targeted by hate speech. Our first panel today will highlight this issue. Instead, we want strong processes based on the rule of law where everybody can enjoy the right to freedom of expression. Secondly, with our campaign, we want to crowdsource input to come up with the best notice and action mechanism possible to set a global standard for strong user rights. What is notice and action? It is the mechanism that allows users to notify potentially illegal content, and that will hopefully in the future also include safeguards for freedom of expression. We, was, we, we will be discussing the details here today. In the first panel, the speakers will be concentrating on the challenges with takedowns and give us examples of problems, problems experienced on social media networks. So what are we going to do today? We will have two panels and the first round will go from now until 1540 more or less. Each speaker will be giving us input of around five minutes and this will be followed by a summary uh, by Marcel Kolaya, who is also an important member of this digital working group. And then we will have a five minutes break to grab coffee. From 1545 until 1620, the second round of speakers will be giving us expert input to the notice and action mechanism that we are developing. And this panel will be moderated by another important member of the digital working group, Kim van Sparentek. At 1620, Patrick Breyer will give us a summary of the input received during the second panel. At uh, half past four, the audience will have the opportunity to ask questions moderated by my colleague, Kim van Sparentek. And at 10 to 5, Marcel Koyaya will conclude the event. So I would, now, now, I would now like to introduce our guests for the first panel, our important speakers. The first one to speak is Lion Storm. Lion Storm is a multidisciplinary Amsterdam-based artist duo consisting of Gail Rama and Steresot van Schoten. I'm sorry for my pronunciation. <laughs> That's just not my strong language. I'm sorry. <laughs> and um, I was told the best way to sum up their work is to say that they're the weirdest photographing and designing queer rap duo in the art scene. I'm very curious to hear what they're going to say, but I will first introduce the other speakers as well. Then we have Dimitar Dimitrov. He's a manager public and of public and regulatory policy at Wikimedia. Wikimedia, you probably all know what Wikimedia is, but it's a nonprofit that hosts Wikipedia. Pedia, 
and our other free knowledge projects. Uh, according to his Twitter bio, he's a political scientist, a global villager, and a coffee addict. And I'm fe I'm feeling very close to you on this one. I think I have four <laughs> until now, and it's not the last yeah. one. <laughs> then we have Akram Kubanichbekov. Sorry, this is not my strong language either, I'm, I'm afraid. I still have stuff to learn. Senior advocacy officer at ILGA Europe. And ILGA Europe is an independent, international, non-governmental umbrella organization bringing together over 600 organizations from 54 countries in Europe and Central Asia that advocates for human rights and equality for LGBTI people. And last but not least, we have Chloe Bertelemy, who is a policy advisor at European Digital Rights, Adri. And Adri is a network of NGOs, experts, advocates, and academics working to defend and advance digital rights across the continent. For almost two decades, it has served as the backbone of the digital rights movement in Europe. Thank you all very much for being here and providing your input. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to our first speaker or first couple of speakers, which is Lion Storm. You have the floor. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Gil Rama, and this is my uh, work partner, but also my partner in love, uh, Stelsoet. Uh, together, we are Lion Storm, a queer artist duo from uh, Amsterdam. Um, we create clothing, photos, uh, our own music videos, which we also direct ourselves and um, uh, make the concept ourselves. And yeah, uh, we stand for a queer representation uh, in the mainstream media. So uh, we do that through our art. And yeah, we experience a lot of resistance uh, putting our content uh, on certain pl platforms. So we're gonna uh, talk about that a bit. Yeah, so we started around four years ago. Before we had any music out, we made pictures. So we started by creating, recreating um, mainstream images, iconic mainstream images of uh, mostly straight couples or, for example, the Vogue billboard that was all through the Netherlands with two famous um, female models who are both um, uh, not in a romantic relationship together they were just posing together uh, so we recreated all these pictures with the queer couples around us to uh, make people realize that these pictures are never of queer couples and what will happen with people when they see this will they realize that there is not enough of this kind of representation in the media um, the first picture we put online was uh, immediately blocked and pulled offline which was um, weird to us because it was the picture of uh, two men who are in a relationship who were kissing each other, um, which was the exact same picture there was of the two women, uh, the two models that was through the entire city of Amsterdam. And no one was offended by that. But when it was the two males, everyone was offended and they blocked the picture and we had our first shadow ban. And this means that on Instagram for 14 days, you are untraceable, you are not on people's newsfeed, your hashtags don't work, you're pretty much completely invisible. This lasts for 14 days and then you're back online. Uh, we started Googling, we saw that Instagram denied that this existed, but we talked to other artists and they confirmed that they've all had this problem, all the queer artists that we knew. Uh, after this, we've been shadow banned a bunch more times. Every time we would recognize this immediately, but there was nothing that we could do. We just had to wait 14 days. Um, so that's as far as Instagram goes. But for our music videos on YouTube, we've had the same kind of problems. So we make music to add another kind of uh, representation to mainstream media. This is why we find it important to be on the bigger media just so uh, young queer people can find different role models and feel that there's nothing wrong with them. This is something we missed when we were young, but also to make other young non-queer people get used to queer bodies, queer love and normalize this. Um, our second music video had an image of us two uh, uh, hugging each other with bare upper bodies. And we've had so much trouble with this video. We couldn't, um, um, promote it in any way on YouTube. Uh, our The person we worked with, who has worked with a lot of artists, was very surprised because he has worked with many male artists that have made very explicit images and he's never had any trouble at all. 
So he never understood why we got pulled off uh, YouTube time and time again. After this, we could never run any promotion or ad around any video on YouTube. Um, but it got worse when three months ago, four months ago, we released a music video for our song Feast, which means filthy. And it's a song about everything about yourself that you don't see in the media, that you feel uh, you have to hide about yourself. Um, that can be being queer, but it can also mean being a woman and not recognizing yourself in the media. Uh, we asked people we found inspiring in this movement to make a clip at home, um, filming this part of themselves that they feel they have to hide. And we made a music video out of all these clips, which was a way to uh, make people uh, embrace the anti-norm in themselves. Uh, and as a, an opposing sound to the uh, very strong norm that's in the mainstream media. Um, in this video, we released it, and after two hours, we got a message that no one could find it. So we looked on YouTube, and there was no way to find our music video. Um, uh, we had no idea what was going on, so we uh, looked on our account, and there was no notification. Uh, all the settings were right, but we, the video was completely invisible. Uh, we asked our team and they looked at it and nobody understood what was going on. So a colleague of ours uh, gave us a contact at YouTube and we emailed them and they said they would look into it. And then nine days later, we got an email saying that someone flagged us, they looked at it. Um, we were uh, not, um, uh, we were okay when it comes to the community guidelines. We didn't do anything wrong, so to speak. So they didn't delete the video, but they made it uh, 18 plus, which means that you can only view the video with an uh, 18 plus YouTube account. Uh, we posted this on our Instagram because people kept asking us, we can't find your video. So we posted, yes, we're back online after nine days. You can find us again. And within one and a half hour, we were gone again. Uh, we emailed YouTube again. Uh, they said they would look at it. And this time it took two weeks before we got an email saying someone uh, reported us for um, um, shocking content, that they were not going to delete the video. This time there was also no 18 plus restriction anymore. But in both response from YouTube, they never responded to the fact that we were completely blocked or banned for uh, more than a week. Um, so it's almost as if they don't really want to admit that they are doing this. Then we noticed that afterwards, um, we had some restrictions to our YouTube accounts. So we talked to some people from the IT side of business and someone informed us that there is um, a flag that can be put with your account if you are reported a bunch of times. If you have this flag, you are restricted in a lot of ways. So when someone reports you, you are immediately gone. Um, uh, you cannot run your ads and this flag needs to be manually removed. Um, so we emailed YouTube again, asking three, four months ago if they would look at this flag and if they could remove it for us. So we got an email back from someone higher up in YouTube asking us um, what label we work with. Um, and we responded that we don't work with a label. We are uh, our own uh, um, managers. We do everything ourselves. And they never responded after that. Uh, and we still have the restrictions which for us is a big problem because our main mission is to make sure that we can show another uh, uh, yes. voice, other representation than the mainstream media. So we want to be found on the bigger platforms, but to be found on the bigger platforms, we need to change the image. We cannot show two men loving each other. We cannot show transgender bodies. We cannot show queer bodies. So we ha so now we are in the problem as artists that we cannot make those music videos or, or images anymore because we will be blocked and people cannot find us. So there will be no use making it. Um, and there is no one to help us because we're not working with any label. So we don't have that kind of contact with YouTube to get helped out of this. So we are in a spiral right now when it comes to that. Thank you so much. I think that really was a perfect case and point that, that that shows the problem. Thank you very much for sharing that experience. And I hope in the insight we will come up with in the second part, in the second panel, and the solution will help you in the future to be able to share your content. I think this is something people need to see, and I hope we'll be able to give a contribution. So.
I would like to give the floor to Dimitar Dimitrov. What are, what are your comments on yes, this? Yes, so um, as you said already, I'm from Wikimedia and we run large to very large online platforms. We have Wikipedia, but we also have uh, Wikimedia Commons, which is a multimedia archive with uh, 65 million audiovisual items. We have Wikidata, um, and it's basically a lot of content out there that um, anybody in the world can contribute to. And with so much content out there, um, at some point, uh, people are bound to get annoyed or to want to have something taken down or removed. Um, and for um, such a, a large uh, operation, we get um, surprisingly few uh, takedown and uh, takedown requests. Uh, it's mainly because we let our communities uh, self-govern. So basically the Wikipedia community, the Wikimedia Commons community, um, they uh, do an amazing job at basically discussing in between themselves what should be uh, on, on Wikipedia or on Wikimedia Commons and what shouldn't be. Um, all of this happens uh, completely transparently, so everybody can read up and participate in every discussion before decisions are taken. Um, nevertheless, we also have a legal department, um, and they receive takedown um, requests. Um, and I've, um, I've, I've noted the numbers today. I, I dug out the numbers for um, 2012 to 2018, so uh, over a period of six years, uh, we have received uh, in a non-formalized man manner, mostly through, through uh, emails or letters, 2,942 takedown requests. Um, and after checking all of them, uh, we have granted exactly one. So one out of 2,942 uh, over a period of six years. Um, but uh, as there is, um, well, in the, in the US, um, there is something called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And this Copyright Act um, um, has uh, formal codified procedures for notice and action rules. Um, and sometimes we also uh, receive DMCA notices, they're called, which are a much more formalized uh, way of doing this. Uh, and over the same period of, of six years, we've received 184 DMCA requests, which is surprisingly little and much, much less than the non-formalized requests. But out of these 184, we have granted 54, um, which is more than a quarter. Um, and um, well, from our perspective, having these formalized procedures uh, creates much less work for our lawyers and for our organization but also gives rights holders or people who think that, um, that you know, there is content there that shouldn't be there and belongs to them and they don't want it there, also gives them a very strong tool that uh, basically uh, where we have to act upon. Um, and um, what happens quite often, and this is, uh, we see it that basically when we notify um, that this content will go down, we do receive counter notices as well. So it also gives the people who put the content up um, a proper and also legally defined uh, protection. Um, so um, from this experience, uh, we're, we're quite supportive of, of formalized notice and action procedures for, for online platforms, simply because they give everybody a certain amount of rights and security, but they also, uh, overall, they reduce the workflow. Um, and from, uh, from this experience, we can also share that um, two, two elements we find quite essential. Uh, on one hand, uh, counter notices um, must be uh, foreseen. Um, and the second thing that uh, we, we think uh, should be included in such um, a notice and action procedure is some sort of liability for uh, people who um, send many, many um, wrongful messages. So we call that basically, um, well, notice trolling when somebody just almost automatically sends you hundreds of messages. There, there, there needs to be a, a, a backstop or some sort of safeguard there. That being said, uh, for us, it works quite well. Uh, but we also, as an organizational culture and as a, as a community, um, we believe in, in sharing as much as possible. And we believe in, in keeping things up and online as, as much as possible. Um, I think what will be challenging and what we need to think about within this Digital Services Act um, is um, how to give incentives to for-profit social platforms uh, to not overblock, to not, in, in when they're uncertain, to not just immediately delete something. 
because quite often from our experience, I mean, we are willing to, to go to court and, and to take a hit and to really fight for keeping things up. But if you're, if I'm like, uh, if I'm a private player, it will be basically just a numbers game. How likely am I, am I to be sued here? And then in the end, let's just delete this image because I prefer not having any troubles. Um, and uh, we we need to think really hard to install some sort of incentive there to basically tell platforms no. Uh, if if you're uncertain, you know, really look into this and don't just delete to be on the safe side. Um, and I think this is the these were my main points for now. Yeah, thank you very much. So you always have you already have some kind of best practice in place, I, I understand. And um, as you said, we also share the conviction that it's very important to have diversity in the net. And if we only have mainstream content because other things are easier to block and to, to get off the internet because there's no incentive, as you're saying, we are going to have a problem because we will have a society that is uh, less diverse. And this is exactly what we want to avoid. And this is exactly what Lionstorm said, what's happening to them. There's no incentive for the platforms to keep their content up. So that makes perfectly sense. Thank you very much for that, Dimi. And we go to the next speaker, who is Akam from Ilga. Can you relate to what have been said? What What are your important points, Akam? You have the floor. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Alexandra and organizers, for inviting Ilga Europe uh, to, this, uh, to this event. And uh, first of all, I, we can relate to that, and I would like to highlight some wrongful takedowns of the content to give you some view of unequal application of the policies and wrongful takedowns uh, of legal content. Uh, so wrongful removals of the content and the banning of the account have been widely documented by multiple uh, initiatives we are aware of. Uh, in addition, in some monitoring organizations, uh, uh, flag that Facebook applies uh, its policies unequally, as it was addressed by the uh, Lion Storm. Uh, YouTube does uh, the same. And uh, for example, online censorship.org, uh, a project of Electronic Frontier Foundation, which addresses the lack of redress for content uh, takedowns uh, uh, by providing a platform where users of social media sites can report uh, the wrongful uh, takedowns found that policy restrictions uh, on adult content uh, have an outsized impact on the LGBTI and other marginalized communities, typically aimed at uh, keeping sites family friendly. Uh, these policies are often unevenly enforced, classifying LGBTI content as, as adult when similar heterosexual content uh, is not taken down, which on, in turn violates uh, uh, rights of the LGBTI people to information, for example, and freedom of expression. So this is why uh, we think that providing transparent and effective not an action mechanism is important for protecting fundamental rights uh, of users in the digital world. And uh, so this not as an action uh, draft law is uh, very timely and uh, fundamental for the uh, protecting freedom of expression of people. And uh, at the same time, the proposed draft law on notice and action eliminates uh, some issues of the legal fragmentation at the EU level and uncertainty at the European level uh, for intermediary companies uh, and fill some gaps left out of the e-commerce directive. And it improves also foreseeability and uh, legal uh, certainty uh, as all stakeholders can easily uh, inform themselves on what behavior is expected of them and, and when. And uh, another point, uh, uh, as, uh, I, I, will, I will not be uh, uh, giving more uh, feedback on the draft law as the colleagues from the EDRI and Access Now are, uh, whose work is more focused on the digital rights and freedoms uh, are here and will be joining later on and discuss in more in detail the technical sides of the draft law. So that's why the, uh, I would like to uh, use this uh, opportunity and um, talk more uh, uh, about the, uh, how to protect uh, uh, vulnerable groups uh, from the illegal content online and which additional steps should be taken uh, uh, complementary to this uh, draft law. Uh, so as any strategy tackling illegal content online uh, needs to 
take the rights of different parties protected under the regional and international human uh, rights framework into account, as noted by Alexandra at the very beginning. The problem of online hate must uh, first and foremost be recognized as a human rights violation and uh, therefore cannot be left solely to the discretion of the private companies as they are not states and they cannot interpret law and uh, creating the law. Therefore, in addition to the reactive mechanisms, such as notes and action mechanisms, uh, states should also uh, adopt full range of permissible, preventive and remedial measures, uh, including policies, legislation, regulations and adjudication, and to protect vulnerable groups, including LGBTI people, uh, from intolerance in online world as well as offline world. And in addition, uh, to ensure effective implementation of the notes and action mechanism by intermediary companies, uh, uh, there should be clear definition of the terms in laws and uh, what considers illegal content at the EU and at national levels, uh, as well as this is important as well as to protect the freedom of expression. Uh, in uh, uh, ILGA Europe, that's why I strongly believe that uh, to combat online hate, both online and offline incitement to discrimination, hostility and violence uh, on all grounds, including sexual orientation, gender identity and gender expression, and any other characteristics uh, to be prohibited by law at the national and uh, European levels uh, as complementary to this draft law and to ensure full protection of the vulnerable groups against hate speech, as uh, we know from the reports uh, of the social media uh, uh, campaigns uh, uh, to the, to the con uh, uh, Code of Conduct. Uh, uh, most of the reported uh, hate speech and et cetera uh, comes uh, against uh, LGBTI group. So, uh, Again, uh, to protect people from uh, against this hate speech in online uh, world at the EU level, there should be a fitness check of the EU legislation in, in addition to this draft law uh, to protect all people from the hate speech. Uh, and uh, grounds for legislative measures on prohibition of inf incitement to discrimination, hostility and violence on all grounds, uh, including the SOGIESC uh, in accordance with the regional and international human rights standards should be explored and of course we also recognize that combating online hate speech is a multifaceted phenomenon and uh, needs more exploring and has multi-stakeholder responsibility in one hand it should be uh, also uh, as explained before it should be as uh, states but uh, online uh, digital services uh, also requires in order to enforce all of it it also requires lots of resources. So that's why we, uh, we call uh, to uh, it, the complexity of the addressing online hate speech means that there can be no single solution, uh, uh, unfortunately. And therefore, at the uh, regional level, research, uh, exchange, uh, assessing different strategies to tackle online hate uh, from legislation in some member states like Germany and France. Uh, and also recommendations to these uh, uh, legislations from the uh, human rights organizations uh, uh, and to policies and strategies by online uh, platforms they all already have in place as the best practices and civil society organizations should be supported and uh, as I think my uh, time for the intervention is up I will stop here and I will be glad to answer any questions at the end of the, uh, this conversation uh, when the floor will be open. So thank you again uh, for this opportunity uh, to be part of this important discussion. Thank you very much, Akram, for sharing this, this very important point that um, the freedom of expression has to be ensured by having good notice and action mechanisms in order to avoid, um, for example, LGBTI content illegally taken down. But hate speech also is a problem. I, I also talk to people who say, well, I'm, I'm not on Facebook, I'm not on Twitter. 
because I get so much hate speech and this spills over into my real life and um, it's, it's just too dangerous for me. And that is a clear limitation of freedom of expression as well that we are tackling as well, not with a notice and action mechanism. Well, even, even with that one, because it's, it's also a way to notify illegal content. So having really a good mechanism to be able to notify this content according to the terms of law or according to community standards is, is also important and it's also included. But you're perfectly right in order to combat hate speech. We need a, a whole array of instruments, legal instruments, enforcement, culture and so on. And Ursula von der Leyen in her State of the Union speech said she would be looking into that, um, into having like a European crime, especially for racist hate speech, speech but that obviously would be would include hate speech against other groups as well. So thank you for that input. And now we go to Edri with Chloe. You have been looking quite a lot into this, so we are very curious to hear your point of view. You have the floor, yeah. Chloe. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. I'm, I'm very grateful to the Greens Group um, for addressing this issue of restriction of freedom of speech online um, because it happens every day and it affects many, many users as we already heard today. Um, first, to, give, to attempt to give a broad picture of the reality today in terms of the scale and impact of content moderation decisions, it's, it's actually super hard to have a comprehensive understanding of all those, these practices. We, we have no consistent statistics and good numbers because the data that is collected and shared publicly by, by platforms is really limited. So at the moment, we only rely on the company's goodwill to uh, share a bit some statistics, um, individual reporting, as we heard today, um, and press stories, um, as well as certain independent community-led initiatives that document regularly the platform's impact on people's speech. Um, and this is, for example, the case of Salty. Um, Salty is an online community of women, uh, trans and non-binary people, and actually they they consulted their, their community in 2019 and they issued a report on Instagram mainly that found that queer people and women of color on, are policed online uh, at a higher rate than the general population. Um, and this is how we, we try at EDRI to observe this phenomenon and follow the issue for many, many years with our members um, by collecting here and there some example to showcase the problems of um, daily freedom of speech violations. Um, I could make a really long list of abusive uh, content restriction. Um, it ranges from iconic uh, false copyright takedown request made by right holders like Sony Music uh, claiming to own Joan Bach uh, Music, um, which is in fact in the public domain and belongs to nobody, um, to content that promotes um, Black Lives Matters rallies um, being completely uh, deleted from social media overnight. Um, I will try to break down uh, to break them down into categories because speech restrictions uh, can take various insidious forms. It is not just content deletion we're talking about, but it, it also encompasses a lot of different uh, content moderation practices, which can equally be detrimental to people's rights and freedoms online. Um, we heard um, today about um, uh, shadow banning that Lion Storm actually um, uh, self experienced. It's a technique of content blocking without letting the targeted users know about it. So it's super hard to seek redress if you don't know that your content is actually restricted. Um, it happens a lot. It's really used a lot by Instagram uh, against uh, queer art, uh, against sex workers who are promoting their work on online. Um, there is also account, account blocking, also very used by Facebook and, and its uh, sister um, company, Instagram. They, Facebook in um, May 2020, this year, they disabled 60 uh, accounts from Tunisian influencers and journalists and activists. Um, this was part of an attempt to counter a disinformation campaign around the Tunisian elections, but in reality that was used for political purposes and obviously those people's activities did not match the inauthentic behaviors um, of the boats that people that Facebook was after. Um, so that was also very kind of shady practice uh, from these companies. Um, similarly, you have hashtag blockings. Hashtags are really important because they gather people around common center of interest online. And once once you block a hashtag, uh, which was which happened on Facebook and Instagram again um, for the Sikh community, so the religious community. 
um, they saw their hashtags uh, being blocked for more than three months. And that was at a time where the community was commemorating um, a massacre that took place in 1984, so really important for them. Um, and there again, their speech and expression was restricted. Uh, you have demoting content in general, so downranking. Um, this is really um, well known by now that TikTok, um, which um, the Intercept, so the, the newspaper found that TikTok curb voluntarily uh, the reach of content posted by LGBTQI plus people, people with disabilities, and people that they find ugly without like letting us know what are the criteria. Um, and then lastly, you have abuse of reporting tools. So this is done by other users, which are using the flagging tools that the platforms provide, but they re massively report content that is perfectly legitimate uh, until the platform makes the decision to block uh, the set content or the set ac account. Um, that happens to a lot of activists that I personally follow on my social media accounts. Uh, where I see them complaining regularly uh, on my feed uh, that their Facebook pages, their, their, that their Twitter accounts uh, will be soon deleted because they have been too many times victim of this type of attack and the platform is not listening to their claims that they're legitimate and that they're in line with the um, terms and conditions. So the problem out there, and despite the existence of community guidelines, which are supposed to explain why a content is being deleted, why a decision is being taken, uh, in most cases, the reasoning behind those takedowns is completely unclear, is completely opaque, and the chances to get justice uh, for wrongfully blocked content are really thin. Like you need to must, like you must be a super lucky person, or you need to know somebody at the company that is a friend to you, or you need to be super successful in triggering uh, like a public outcry, and so you get public support, and with the public pressure, the company might change its mind. Um, so my conclusion for today is, um, is that the situation is really suboptimal for freedom of expression of people online. Um, in the minds of most people, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, there are public spheres because this is where they mainly express themselves online and, and meet each other, but they remain private companies. Um, so mostly with an ad-based business model as well. And so de facto, they have a bigger responsibility to their shareholders and their advertising customers, and therefore they serve their interest rather in priority, rather than the interest of, of users and rather than protecting users' uh, freedom of speech. And from the example we, we heard today, um, we can notice that their shareholders and advertising customers prefer mainstream views and are very discriminatory towards marginalized voices. Um, the second big problem is that they act as gatekeepers um, determine, uh, determining what constitutes uh, acceptable speech uh, for public consumption. And because they have become so large with a user base of, of billion, um, their rules apply to a crazy big diversity of uh, culture, of linguistic norms, and, and thus in a completely like one size fits all approach, which doesn't work. Um, and it, it, it means that if tomorrow Facebook changes its terms, of con uh, terms and conditions suddenly, Without prior notice, it impacts the online expression of billions of people at once, and nobody can do anything about it. Um, so we obviously believe it's super important to introduce procedural rules like notice and action for tackling the illegal content on online platforms. Um, but um, there is a bigger problem which needs to be addressed, and that is that most uh, restriction happening online of online uh, expression nowadays are based on the terms and condition of these giants. Um, and this is why Edry is not simply proposing measures in the DSA to fix the problems on big social media, um, asking for more transparency, asking for more accountability from them, but also to put into question their very all powerful nature um, over our online lives. Um, and we believe that users and communities should be empowered. They should be able to create their own online expression spaces and define by, the, by themselves the rules that apply, that guide their online discussions and debates and define for themselves what is acceptable or not. Thank you for listening. I'm happy to receive questions. Thank you, Matt. Thank you very much, Chloe. That, that was really interesting and I think you really pointed the finger to the huge issues we should be tackling with the DSA and we really need 
all your support to bring this into the political realm where many colleagues are not not so sensitive to <laughs> to what you've been saying i think we we are picking this up and we are, we have already brought it into discussion into the discussion these points with the own initiative report of the parliament for the dsa i think what you said is that especially your last remarks particularly resonate very well with my colleague marcel kolaya who's a long time fighter with ditch for digital rights very happy to have in the digital working group as a prominent member of the Green Group, although he's a pirate. And um, he has the uh, nice task to, have, to, to draw a short summary of what has been said so far. Marcel, you have the floor. Thank you, Alexandra. Indeed, uh, it's a pleasure to summarize this. I heard um, a lot on um, uh, issues, and we heard a lot on issues, more importantly, uh, relating to uh, limiting the freedom of expression. On uh, on one hand, uh, the hate speech that might even prevent uh, people from going online, uh, from being on social networks because they feel threatened. On other hand, over removal of content and unjustified uh, removal of content where the remedy is lasting for days. We have um, heard of uh, stories of content taken down and being actually completely the account taken down uh, from uh, social networks for days or maybe even weeks and uh, repeated removal from, from YouTube uh, that is completely unjustified and then you know remedy taking really long uh, taking YouTube really long to get back uh, and and to, to act. Um, also, one of the issues apparently is uh, that not having a standard procedure for uh, requesting taking content down and uh, receiving on, on the provider side the request in an informal way, uh, that creates a lot of burden uh, to go through all these requests, a lot of administrative burden. We heard um, from Wikipedia that um, over the course of six years, they received uh, around 3,000 informal requests and only one request actually was granted in comparison with um, the situation when it comes to a standardized requests from the United States based on the uh, DMCA, where from 184, 54 were granted. So I think that clearly shows uh, the need for a, st a standard notice and action procedure. And uh, we have also heard, you know, from um, uh, for we have also heard about content being taken down for politic for different reasons, for political reasons. We have heard about activists uh, being flagged and blocked. And now, what it means for us as legislators. Um, I would say that these are clear examples why we need a standardized framework for notice and action, because all these issues uh, could be solved by having a standardized framework for notice and action, where not only it would uh, be easy for, uh, for, for people to request taking content down, it would also, um, lower the administrative burden for those who need to process it. And it would also uh, create a, um, a, a formalized way, a standardized way to remedy um, requests that are not justified. All that we need to keep in mind in our second panel that we will have after break. And um, uh, that will, that where we will pick up basically um, on, uh, on these issues, we, look, we will look at our notice and action uh, model law or model framework, how we envisage that it should work. And I'm, I'll be very glad to hear, and I'm, I'm uh, sure that uh, other uh, others will be equally glad to hear from our experts what they think about having this framework, what they think about how the framework should work and what they think about uh, the, the draft that uh, we have created. So thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank our speakers uh, from the first panel. Uh, I'd like to thank the audience. Uh, now I 
uh, pass the floor back to Alexandra, uh, who would formally uh, call for a short break, I guess, and then we uh, continue with the second panel. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much, Marcel. And you already um, introduced practically the second panel. So you will all be very curious, I assume, to know what our draft model law is going to look like and what the experts are, uh, are saying to that. So thank you all very much for your contribution. That was very precious, um, very interesting. Now you have five minutes time to grab coffee and um, then come back for the second panel. I will not see you again because the second panel will be moderated by Kim van Sparentag, but she's a great moderator and you'll have fun and you'll get a lot of interesting insights. So see you in five minutes. Bye bye.
Hello everyone and welcome back. I hope you had a nice break and um, that you had some time to reflect on everything you heard during the first panel. Um, my name is Kim van Sparatak. I'm a member of the European Parliament from the Netherlands for the Greens and very happy to moderate uh, this panel. I'm taking over the moderation now from my colleague Alexander. Um, the second round of expert input will focus on the notice, notice and action rules. We will hear from each panelist what the most important elements for strong procedures should look like. Um, I will first introduce the speakers. First of all, we have Jan Penfrat, policy advisor at the European Digital Rights, and EDRI. And EDRI is a network of NGOs, expert advocates, and academics working to defend and advance digital rights across the country. And for almost two decades, it has served as the backbone of the digital rights movement in Europe. Well, secondly, we have Martin Husovec. He's assistant professor of law at the London School of Economics and Political Science and fellow at Stanford Law School Center for Internet and Society. He's been working on notice and action procedures for many years now and written extensively on the topic. Very welcome to you as well. Then we have Thomas Loniger. He's the executive director at Epicenter Works. And uh, Epicenter Works is an Austrian NGO committed to fundamental rights in the digital age. The organization is running a project called Concrete proposals already published at plat platformregulation.eu. Welcome to you. And Eliska Pirkova is also one of our panelists. She has been working for many years on freedom of expression on the internet, online content regulation, and intermediary liability. She's a policy ana analyst at Access Now Europe. And Access Now is an international organization that defends and extends the digital rights of users at risk around the world. Then we have two more, bear with us. Gabrielle Guilemins, Senior Legal Officer at Article 19, where she leads the organization's work on digital rights policy issues, including intermediary liability. Article 19 is an international human rights organization with a specific mandate and focus on the defense and promotion of freedom of expression. And Matthias Vermeulen, Matthias, legal and public policy expert in information technology law. Since only a few months, he is the director of the new AWO. This is a data rights organization based in Brussels, London, and Paris. Welcome to you all. Very nice to all see you here digitally. Um, so you'll all have about five minutes each to, to give uh, your insight. So please, uh, let's start with the first speaker, which is Jan Penfrat. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kim. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm very glad to be here. Um, I'd, I'd just like to basically first start by saying uh, that um, I'm very grateful for the Greens taking this, this step and being proactive and coming up with ideas about how to best um, legislate around notice and action uh, because it is a very um, complex topic. Um, it is um, it's difficult to get it right. Um, it's messy uh, in, in many details and I think everybody who has dived into the details will probably uh, agree that, that, um, that this is really not an easy field to legislate. Um, so I think it's it's good to start the discussion early, um, and I think it's 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 uh, brave and courageous uh, by the Greens Group to uh, to do the first uh, to are the first ones to, to do that really in in public. Um, in terms of the um, of the content, there there will be a lot of things to say about the proposal, the draft text that uh, that that you put out here out here, um, and that would not fit into five minutes, but luckily there are other speakers and they will probably dive into the details uh, much more than, than I do now as the first speaker. Um, I would just like to point out two or three um, things, more general points. Um, one is that um, when I read the text first, I had the impression that, um, that, the, that the proposal frames the whole power uh, to assess the illegality of content around the hosting provider first. Um, and while it is true that in any notice and action system, the hosting service provider will be the first one to kind of get the notice and kind of you know have you know have to has to think about this this question of illegality at first. Um, we at Atrium we don't we don't think this should be the the only actor in, in this game, and I think this should be um, reflected in uh, in the framing uh, as well. Um, and obviously, it is partly, you know, built into later, you know, when you talk about the redress mechanism and also the bits about 
the uh, the independent dispute settlement mechanism, something that we really like and support um, uh, as a mechanism um, to enable users to actually get redress uh, from an independent party without having to go to court. Um, I think it's important to um, to have courts involved and have always the possibility to go to court. Um, but we also need to recognize that most normal people um, would probably not do it. Um, uh, so, I mean, how many people would have the resources and skills uh, and uh, um, to to really kind of yeah, take basically a, a platform provider to court over a tweet or a Facebook post? Um, so that's why that why this independent dispute settlement mechanism is is, is a good thing. Um, generally, um, the second thing that I think that that uh, is related to the first point um, that I would like to mention is that it would probably be worth um, clarifying um, in the language more precisely uh, when a particular piece of content is actually to be considered illegal. So in some instances, the text refers to content as being illegal um, just because the platform has looked at it. And I think that, I don't think that is how it should work. It's not the platform that decides whether or not it's something illegal. It is in the prerogative of a platform to decide whether or not something should be taken down at first. Um, but the legality assessment is something that platforms shouldn't shouldn't be officially doing. And as long as a court, no court has looked at it, or no independent dispute settlement mechanism has looked at the content, um, it, the, the law shouldn't call it illegal content um, uh, because that assumes that as just because someone has notified something, that means that it's illegal. And we heard in the first session um, how regularly, how often there are false flaggings or um, wrongful notices, uh, either deliberately or just by you know by lack of knowledge or by you know ignorance. Um, and and I think this needs to be taken into account uh, that notice and action mechanism always risks to be exposed to uh, abusive notices. Um, either because someone doesn't want someone else to say something particularly, uh, or uh, even in a commercial context, that's something that we hear from consumer protection groups often, um, basically asking for like flagging content as illegal, flagging, for example, the sales of product on, on e-commerce platforms um, is something that is often used as a tactic to, um, to take down competing sellers uh, in you know, the very important kind of first uh, a big, a first period of time when a new product is sold, let's say a new, a new iPhone comes out and then you take down the competing sales, uh, sellers uh, on the platform uh, only for a short time, and that has already a big impact. So I think it's important to keep this in mind when, when we uh, formulate these things. Um, I would put a stop here for now and give more time to the other speakers to also dive into more detail into what they think should be improved in the text. Thank you. Thank you very much for your input. Um, then we can go to the next speaker, which is Martin Husovic. Can you hear me? Yes, no problem. Okay, excellent. Okay, so hi, hi everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for inviting me. Um, uh, thank you for sharing uh, this interesting proposal for model law. I, I mean, I did share couple of observations already over email and um, I will concentrate on the big on big picture um, issues which perhaps merit a little bit of more uh, conceptual rethink or uh, calibration there um, so I'll focus on three points first of all um, on the institutional setup uh, second of all on ADR and third on notifications and standardization of notifications so institutional setup uh, I think it's very crucial uh, that we recognize that um, if we want to move with this area, shed more lights into the area and improve our thinking about the area, um, at the very least on the EU level, we need to change the institutional makeup. Uh, that is, at the moment, we have institutions that exercise their um, competences in different areas, uh, like... Um, uh, you know, internal security or a data protection law or IP law. Um, but we have no one that would feel responsible from the institutions for uh, freedom of expression issues. And, and this deficit on the European level means that uh, freedom of expression is always seen as an exception. Um, 
So I think one of the important things to solve on the EU level, if we want to get a conversation right in the long run, is actually we need to re rebalance that. And we need an institution, doesn't have to be any regulator of, of any strong kind, but at least sort of an uh, internet ombudsman type that, that can actually be the voice um, which tries to speak to whatever initiatives are happening on the EU level, whatever happening is whatever is happening on the ground and collect um, collect uh, data about what is happening on the ground, perhaps being a soundboard or generally a place where you can uh, file your complaints. So um, we need this um, because otherwise this view and these problems will never have a channel on the European level, hence they will never be taken very seriously. Um, so I think this is very important. Now, you know, the Council of Europe had a call for uh, for something like this just very recently. Um, I, there's one thing that perhaps the only thing I disagree with that call, which is it's very crucial. What is the body that houses this uh, type of um, ombudsman? Um, and that is, you know, if you um, if you house it with a data protection authority, I'm a little bit skeptical because data protection law uh, has very often conflicts with the freedom of expression. I'm not sure they can get it. Uh, properly right. If you if you house it with the uh, with the market regulators again, I might be a little bit skeptical because they might not be so uh, th used to thinking about uh, these sort of issues. Media regulators perhaps better. Again, not ideal, but um, so that's one of the things that I like to flag. We need institutional support around this, even if it's of soft kind, to just de-bias the entire framework which doesn't care about freedom of expression by definition because no one exercises too much competences in this area. Second point um, is about ADR. I very much like the fact that you uh, that you foresee ADR, but I don't think it's sufficient uh, just to write that there should be ADR. What does it mean that there should be ADR? Does it mean that all the uh, services have a compulsory ADR service? That they have to designate compulsory ADR service? Or is it just a choice? I think this is something that is crucial. Um, for any ADR to work, you need several things. If you prescribe it, that's a different that's a different matter. But if you don't prescribe it, it's important that you actually incentivize uh, companies to use ADR and offer ADR to its customers uh, and users. So what do you need to do? First of all, you need to offer them immunity if they want to implement decisions of ADR, which shouldn't be too difficult. ADR decisions, as you have drafted them, they should be decided by experts. So um, the chances are uh, very low that uh, the decision that uh, was decided by ADR and then implemented by the platform um, is uh, is wrong. So the chances of that are very, are very low. And hence, um, it's very appropriate to offer uh, immunity to implement decisions of ADR to uh, to a platform. Obviously, this should be always um, subject to possible challenge before the court. Uh, but in the meantime, there should be immunity as long as ADR was uh, was a sort of certified competent ADR that uh, fulfills other qualitative criteria which you have listed. Second, um, it's not enough to um, rely on the on the citizenship of platforms, and I think you need to make decisions of platforms also binding, at least temporarily, for the platforms. So I think one of the solutions that preserves freedom uh, of contract and generally freedom to uh, set up your service as you wish is to say, well, the decision of ADR is binding on the platform for, uh, for at least period of three months. If they want to change the terms of use, they can do so, but not earlier than in three months. Why is that? Because most of the, most of the content is time sensitive. If they want to ch make a change, that's all right. But if, if, if they make a change and you know why it's changing, A, you can campaign as a consumer against that change. You can prepare for that change and it doesn't take away possibility to be online during the critical period. And the third point about ADR is that you need to think about financing. You cannot assume that member states do the job properly. There are two different situations here. There is ADR for situations which are sort of market-driven uh, disputes, IP disputes, uh, personality rights disputes, and there's sort of more public-minded disputes, hate speech, child abuse material. Those are very different types of ADR. You cannot expect the user to pay if it's about hate speech, but you might expect the user to pay if it's about his content to some extent. Uh, so this financing is something you need to figure out. When should the state shoulder the cost of ADR and when it should be up to the private parties, that being potentially not only the user, but also the platform. 
Um, my preferred model for these kind of economic disputes is that user pays some uh, deposit up front. And if um, um, he or she is successful, then the platform has to bear the cost and compensate uh, the ADR because it's eventually their mistake that led to this dispute. Last point, um, notification. Standardization of notification is a very important thing and I completely agree with what uh, was previously said. I think we need to clarify here, there are two types of entities that send notifications, private and public, totally different world. Public entities should not be notifying uh, terms of use violations uh, because of the rule of law. Private entities, it's a, different, uh, it's a different matter. We should have different rules governing these two different entities when they notify. And what is crucial? We need to have incentives for quality. What I'm missing in a proposal is recognition that there are trusted notifiers. You mentioned them, but you don't foresee them. There are trusted notifiers which whose status is conditioned upon not the fact that they are state authorities, but that they deliver quality. If you have very few mistakes, you can be trusted. And that means that you should you should have something in return, which is, you know, the speed of evaluation of your notifications would be the most appropriate thing to offer to you. So have trusted notifiers, offer them faster, um, uh, faster assessment since you were credible in the past. But don't make it conditional on the fact that someone is a state authority with a bad track record only. With this connected, the, the, you also need to follow, um, to deal with the, with the opposite scenario. You need to offer disincentives for bad quality, which means that you need to have, and this is much more difficult, either collective redress, or as I mentioned, you force platforms to compensate for wrongful um, uh, decisions once the ADR was successful on the user side, uh, or uh, you try to introduce kind of uh, fines in building the notifications, which can be much more difficult, but could be done with some notifiers. So um, care about all of these. Incentives are what will make this work or not. Um, some interesting ideas are um, offered in the German pro discussion proposal for Article 17 if, when it comes to overblocking, so perhaps have a look at that. That's all. Thank you so much. Um, then we go to Eliska Pirkova. Hello, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much for having me. It's a great pleasure to join you all today. Um, and I especially would like to thank the organizer also to actually bring in uh, organizations and actors that are directly impacted by um, rather dysfunctional uh, approach to content governance in general. It was great uh, to hear uh, from both. And I can only confirm that uh, from the perspective of Access Now, one of the activities that Access Now is also doing is to run a digital security helpline. And uh, uh, we are increasingly witnessing quite a sharp increase in um, submissions that are related to unjustified content removals, especially from underrepresented groups such as LGBTQI+. Um, we often are not really allowed to actually disclose these data due to the fact that we need to protect human rights defenders on the ground. But this is the overall trend that also confirms that everything that has already been mentioned and said during the uh, intervention during the first session. Um, so uh, I will now move to notice and action procedure and I will try to elaborate a little bit further on a few points even though many interesting and uh, points have already been raised by two previous speakers and they are right on the spot of course. Um, for us, uh, Access Now has a clear position on notice and action. It's the part of our positioning on DSA. Uh, in many ways, it supports everything that Edri has been doing and Edri has already stated during their interventions. Um, of course, we strongly believe that no notice and action procedure cannot be underestimated by a legislator uh, because as it has already been mentioned, it reinforces the legal certainty and foreseeability for all uh, actors being involved and uh, subjected to this uh, regulation. Um, I also would like to maybe emphasize very quickly that when we speak about notice and action, the way how Access Now and many other actors actually think about it, for us, notice and action should primarily consider illegal type of user-generated content. Uh, then that means illegal in forms of, and, and then based on that, we envision or we suggest sort of two ideas. 
uh, how to actually go about notice and action. And this was the part also of our submission to the DSA public consultation. So we are strongly defending notice and judicial takedown, uh, which if I now go back to the proposal, which by the way, I think is a great start. And thank you very much for that work. Even though there are a few things that will still need to be clarified and tuned. Uh, the emphasis on judicial redress, on public judicial authority that will actually assess the legality of the content, at, as has already been mentioned, is also a priority for us. The judicial redress always have to be available to online users, even if there is another form of alternative dispute settlement available to them. Um, and we will need to look for ways how to actually make these judicial redress more accessible to online users, because very often, for instance, victims of online hate speech do not seek judicial redress do not go to public authorities and there is a definitely a huge gap also between law enforcement and how to actually provide assistance to victims of online hate speech and other societal phenomena online that have far-reaching negative impact on especially underrepresented groups um, now uh, we also think that for instance for private uh, disputes uh, uh, notice and notice plus system that was proposed in Canada and further elaborated by Emily Laidlaw and other academics in this field uh, could be also the way where again intermediary doesn't take a direct decision on the content. Um, I won't go into details on these procedures, they are the part of our submissions and also uh, the part of our position papers on DSA and if there are any further questions about these models I can elaborate later on. For us, what is also really, really important is not just the definition of any notice, but what actually amounts to a valid notice. So the valid notice has to actually meet certain criteria uh, in order to be then taken into consideration by intermediary and that it sparks the action and all procedures is then actually moving on and moving forward. Uh, this is not particularly specified in this proposal. Um, the proposal only speaks about notice and we would rather see the exact criteria of what actually constitute valid notice. Um, I think what I'm also a little bit missing in this proposal is then speaking about timeframes. Now, everyone is very familiar with the Constitutional Council decision in France, which also actually uh, saw the 24 hour time frame for content removal as unconstitutional. I would maybe appreciate at least the mentioning of timeframes for notice and action. And it's very important that these timeframes are transparent. They are clearly communicated to online users. So they know how long it will take to content moderators to actually decide on the piece of content, how long it will take to appeal, how long time it will take to submit or they have to submit the counter notice and so on. Uh, we also strongly believe that these timeframes should be actually included in transparency reporting for online platforms. So we know exactly how the decisions about the piece of content are being made. Uh, furthermore, uh, I really welcome the fact that the counter notice is the part of this proposal, which is a, a great uh, form of how to actually secure the procedural safeguard of procedural justice and fairness for online users. However, from our positioning, we always want to see, uh, and not only the counter notice, but also the notification for users, uh, for content providers, that something is going to be done to their content and from our positioning, we would like to see these notices being submitted before any action is actually being taken. Uh, so the content provider knows from the start that there is uh, some sort of procedure uh, to take place. Um, this is not the part of this proposal. At least this is not the way how I interpreted it when I read it. Uh, and finally, the transparency requirements. Uh, and I will stop there because I think I'm running out of my five minutes. Um, I think that especially the list of transparency requirements regarding online platforms is quite exhaustive. I'm sure that there could be more things uh, involved uh, and including in this proposal. However, when it comes to the transparency for member states, which is equally an uh, important aspect on transparency, I would still maybe like to see a little bit more granular conditions for transparency, especially when then the states actually issue injunctions or removal orders for platforms. Um, 
and my final point would be, of course, we as well, and that has already been mentioned uh, by many speakers, we see as the main issue when it comes to content governance, the uh, attention economy and business models of companies and platforms. Um, and of course, when we discuss notice and action, we cannot go deeper into topics such as content curation or algorithmic uh, content curation, especially personalization content of content and content recommender systems. Uh, however, that's the key for us as well. So not only how the content is being moderated, but also how it's being distributed. We've been thinking a lot about this also with other stakeholders. We already have the set of policy recommendations in place for, for those. And I think that one of the ways how to actually, or the main key issue that to, to focus on is how to return the agency control and the choice back to the user. And this is incredibly important, especially for vulnerable and underrepresented groups. So they have a choice. They can actually create platforms and online places and spaces that are safe and follow their own values uh, that they actually want to want to believe in and that protects them ultimately um thank you very much i'll stop here there is so much more i could still bring in but uh, there are also other brilliant speakers who won't let us down there so thank you thank you very much um then we go to thomas loniger yeah um first thank you very much for the invitation um and thanks in particular for the green IFA group to take up this very complicated issue um i know about the difficulties if one tries to navigate and even come up with solutions um around uh, fundamental rights lines and um yeah i can support uh everything that was said by the previous speakers uh in particular um Elishka has basically taken most of the points away that I wanted to raise, but expressed them far more brilliantly than I could have done. Um, so um, one thing that I, um, coming from the beginning, would like to say is it's good that this proposal focuses on uh, the notification procedure, because I think one of the more clear-cut uh, solutions to the difficult problems of content moderation is actually the notification procedure. And establishing balanced rules that actually help the majority of users to come to a better decision and provide the platform with adequate information, um, that is really something um, that uh, should definitely be in any upcoming DSA proposal. Um, the second big thing that I am very happy with this is that um, liability is completely unchanged with that because I think that is uh, very important to, to um, make this clear. Um, and uh, then I would like to focus on the transparency obligations because coming from Austria, uh, we've been working over the past few months quite extensively with the Austrian uh, proposal for a NETS DG, so similar to the German and French proposal. And um, I actually could see some of the elements that are quite similar in these transparency obligations. Um, there are minor details that, for example, quarterly reports are remedied for bigger platforms. Um, as Elishka suggested, timeframes of the actions that platforms have taken are also part of the, the reports. Um, and I'm um, very happy that um, the proposal here has actually uh, added something that we were asking for, but sadly did not find in the, in the notified law, which is uh, algorithmic impact assessment. So I think it is key that we shine a light on the use of partly or fully automated technologies in the um, content moderation processes of platforms, because um, they play an ever increasing role and it's important to get a better scientific and regulatory understandings of these technologies that shape our, our um, discourses online every day. Um, one thing that I would uh, suggest uh, um, to, to, to improve the transparency uh, obligations, and that is actually, we managed to get this in the Austrian proposal, is to give the regulator, whoever it may be, the power to actually lay down guidelines that further specify the transparency reports. This is, a necessary learning out of German NetzDG, because without such detailed guidelines that might change over time, the validity and comparability of those reports cannot be ensured. We have to assume that platforms will do, will do everything they can to muddy the waters. And so having clear guidelines on how to actually come to those statistics are vital for um, all of the stakeholders that will take use of these reportings. And I would also suggest that stakeholders are invited and consulted in such a process. 
Um, I'm not going to uh, touch on the question who should be the enforcement regulator because I really feel like this is a, a display, debate for another day. Um, and in general, um, I would also like to add that one thing that is quite uh, troubling to me in that proposal is the question of when do we speak about illegal content, when do we speak about other cases of content moderation, at which point do we actually establish uh, illegality? And uh, for me, and I think I'm not alone in civil society, this can only be done by courts. So having a way to, to get uh, the courts involved in actually establishing illegality is vital in my opinion. Um, and um, alternative dispute uh, resolution, ADR, as it was called before, uh, is an important uh, element that one can use to also take the, the, the majority of the pressure away from the courts. But uh, I don't think it is uh, um, essential and I, I don't think it's sufficient. And so, um, and, and just to lastly touch on the um, uh, on the question on how to finance such bodies, I think Edry proposed this, and again, the Austrian NetsDG already has this in there. You just make the platforms pay a fee that is uh, proportional to their market share, and um, the budget of the arbitration body or the regulator uh, is just divided accordingly to the market participants. And that leads to quite a strong, powerful regulator, which I think we'll need in order for the DSA to... to um, um, work in practice. And one one last thing maybe just to add, because I think Jan said it before that very few people actually take um, uh, use the avenue to the courts in order to come to a conclusion. The possibility of class actions, I think, uh, should be explored further to just get marginalized groups, uh, um, uh, give them a, better, a stronger voice in that whole process. And um, those could be seen as collective rights instead of individual rights as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, then we go to our next speaker, speaker Gabriele Guillemins. Guillemins. How do you pronounce your name? <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> um, thanks very much uh, for inviting uh, Article 19 uh, to this event. Uh, we're very grateful to the Greens Group for taking on this uh, very uh, complex uh, issue of uh, notice and action processes which can be quite, um, you know, getting into the nitty gritty and um, it's very easy to get into a rabbit hole here. Um, I'll try and be brief because many of the points um, uh, I was going to raise have already been uh, wonderfully and brilliantly addressed by uh, all the previous speakers and I very much agree um, with what they've said. So um, let me just start then by going a bit backwards and think a little bit about um, why we're having this discussion about a Digital Services Act. Um, one of the reasons we've had problems with the e-commerce directive, particularly from a free expression perspective for many years, is um, lack of legal certainty. Because um, under the ECD, um, a very difficult question has been to know when does um, a hosting provider gain actual knowledge um, of illegality? And so it's been very unclear about how those host pro hosting providers gain actual knowledge. Is it a notice? Is it a court order? Is it, what is it? And so um, faced with this legal uncertainty in practice, um, companies have had an incentive to remove content so that they wouldn't be exposed to a risk of liability. So uh, in this sense, it's very important to get more clarity in this area. And so uh, talking about more streamlined and standardized notice and action procedures is a, is a step in the right direction. And so in that sense, also um, the proposal uh, that you shared with us um, is also a step in the right direction. Second, I want to talk very briefly about how Article 19 has approached the, the, these issues for many years. And so, um, for us, really, one of the cornerstones has been to really put the decision of deciding questions of legality in the hands of the courts, because we think that they are the only ones who have the legitimacy to make these decisions. And so our approach has been to divide um, the notice and action procedures into two different parts. On the one hand, we have notice and notice procedures for private disputes, like copyright or defamation. And on the other hand, we have a court-based model when it comes to um, criminal type of content that would involve 
um, law enforcement agencies, for instance. So very briefly looking at notice and um, notice models, I think the key point about them is really trying to remove the decision making from the hands of the intermediary. So really it's a process whereby the intermediary is only passing on the complaint um, that someone has made about a particular piece of content and then the person who um, uh, posted the content itself can decide whether or not they want to act on it. Um, and if not, they can respond and then the parties themselves try and resolve the dispute. And if they're unhappy, they can take it um, to court. The court-based model for criminal content is really uh, saying that, um, as I was saying earlier, the court should decide in the first instance. So you shouldn't leave it just to law enforcement agency to decide what content um, is illegal, for instance, uh, uh, terrorist content. So with this in mind, um, we, we've put forward this model where a court would decide, but in urgent cases, uh, a law enforcement agency might be able to um, make an order. And then, um, and then, um, if the situation is urgent, they can do it. They can do that, but then it needs to be confirmed by a court very shortly afterwards. For instance, within twenty four hours. Now, moving on to the proposal um, that you've put forward, I think here uh, I'd like to make. Um, three three points, um, or like just giving some elements for food for thought. Um, I think the first one is reiterating what's already been mentioned about the role of the courts uh, in deciding legality, because at the moment, um, the, the first um, port for decision making is the, the intermediary, um, which can be understandable for practical reasons, but it's very important to bear in mind that at this point, it's only either an intermediary or the, the complainant uh, having an opinion about whether or not the content is illegal. So um, I think it's very important here to, to really clarify um, at what point um, a court is making a, a decision uh, on this issue. Um, the second uh, related to it is really trying to understand the role of the counter notice. Um, because in, in some frameworks, for example, in the United States where you have the DMCA, the counter notice has a specific um, um, has specific consequences in relation to the party who made the complaint in the first instance, and so here it sounds like the counter notice resembles um, an appeal. So it might be useful to clarify exactly the, the role of that particular counter notice. And again, it seems that it's the the intermediary itself who um, has to take the decision once it receives the counter notice. So I think it'd be useful to, to, to think a little bit about the dynamics um, here. Um, the second point is to um, perhaps um, um, think a little bit about the interaction between um, notice and action procedures um, for illegal content, which I think is correct. Um, the focus should very much be on that. But I think it's also very important to, to bear in mind how the, the platforms themselves are likely to uh, deal with such requests and the workflow for them, because they will also be getting um, uh, requests for takedown on the basis of their terms of service. And so I think it's important to, 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 to look into the dynamics be, between the two. Um, another related issue to think about is um, it may well be in some circumstances that content is uh, legal, um, and so, but it might be in breach of the terms of service. And I think that um, many of the stories we've heard in the first session uh, relate to that. So it's just thinking a little bit more about what does that mean, um, if uh, and what you know what should happen if content is actually legal but is in breach of uh, a company's terms. Uh, of service? Does it mean a must-carry obligation, uh, for instance, uh, for, for this type um, of content? And I think that one place where, um, you know, that could require, this, that could be looked into a bit further is in the definitions and how we understand content moderation. Is content moderation just about legal requirements or is it um, a mixture of legal requirements and what the companies do on the basis of um, their terms of service? And uh, finally, um, I think it would be also useful to, to, to think about how um, these proposals in the DSA will relate to existing um, EU legislation. Um, so, for instance, uh, the uh, Audiovisual Media Services Directive. 
um, the draft terrorism regulation, the copyright directive. Um, I think it's important to think about, you know, what content exactly um, will will be covered um, by by the DSA in practice. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And now we will already go to our last speaker in this panel, uh, Matthias Vermeulen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. And thank you for the invite and congratulations also to the drafters of the of this draft bill. Um, I think it was Jan who said that this is really a messy topic, but you definitely uh, moved it in the right direction. Um, I had some remarks and comments on the draft bill, of, on the draft bill but basically all the previous speakers, uh, in particular Martin and Ilishka, have mainly made the five key points that I wanted to raise as well. So I just I'm going to very briefly stress like those five key points, and then like um, make one additional point. Um, I think like what the three main points that Martin made that I found also really important was that there is indeed this need to make a very clear distinction between notifications from private entities and public in entities. I think that could definitely be improved in the in the current draft bill. I think what Martin was saying also about the need to change the institutional makeup to actually make this work is actually extremely important. And that's less of a matter for legal drafting, but more a sort of exercise in political will, what's possible and what can what can be done, actually. And then the third point that Martin raised that I also definitely um, agree with is the need to recognize somewhere in the bill um, trusted notifiers and offer disincentives of um, for bad quality notifiers um, as well. Um, then the two points that Ilishka made that I also had sort of on my um, uh, sheet here were uh, the point about valid notices. I think that's really extremely important to, to, to be included as well. Like when is the notice actually a valid one? And also the need about transparent um, timeframes. So I could just stop here and then end my presentation because you have all set everything, everyone, everything has been set. Um, but I'd also, I think I'd also like to touch upon two sort of broader points, um, which relate to the scope of the proposal and its interaction with potential new due diligence obligations relating to harmful content that might be imposed on gatekeeper platforms in the ex ante part of the Digital Services Act, which I think is something that I think would be helpful to mention, for instance, at least in the recitals um, to this bill as well. And I think that's especially important if the goal is, as MEP uh, Geza has said in, uh, in the beginning of the seminar, when the goal of the DSA is to be a blueprint for other countries uh, to follow. And I think it's also important um, because some of the examples that we've heard in the previous section, in the, uh, the first section, had trouble with the removal of content that definitely wasn't illegal. And it was also a point made by, by Gabriel, um, uh, Gabriel earlier. Um, and it's also important about like what Ilishka said about the importance of not to forget about the need to address content curation and distribution mechanisms um, as well. Now, I think it's really uh, regarding the scope, it's really a no brainer that the scope of this proposal should be limited to illegal content only. And the liability regime should be focused only on illegal content, um, especially if the envisaged measure is to take down that content. And I think in the IMCO report, the parliament already agreed that there needs to be this strict distinction made between illegal and um, harmful uh, content. Um, and I agree with that assessment, although in practice, it's it, the distinction will be quite quite blurry sometimes and, and, and hard to make. Um, however, now I'm really interested to know like how this proposal would interact with measures that companies are supposed to take to counter harmful content since First of all, in general, notes and action mechanisms based on companies' terms of services, they would also apply to, to such content. And Chloe also referred to this already in the previous panel, outlining how most content removals are actually already happening because of violations of the company's terms of services. And then the second point, this definition of content moderation in the current bill in uh, Article 2D, I think it is, also actually cover harmful content since it just refers to, and I quote now, the practice of sorting content provided by recipient of a service by applying a predetermined set of rules and guidelines in order to ensure that the content complies with legal and regulatory requirements and terms and conditions. So um, 
While indeed, like in this, at the same time, like the IMCO report basically suggests that measures to combat harmful content should be regularly evaluated and developed further. Now, my question is like, how is this evaluation actually going to happen if, if all the really good transparency measures that are outlined in Article 9 don't apply to these measures, actually? So to the drafters, like I have the question, like, do you envisage to have similar safeguards in this ex ante part of the DSA? while new obligations would apply for dominant gatekeeper or, or systematic platforms or however you want to um, to, come to to call them. I think then similarly, um, automated content moderation tools are also used to detect harmful content by the platform as well. And this is something that, that Thomas was um, already hinting at as well when he was talking about algorithmic impact assessments and, and their needs, for instance. Um, and so in, in article, um, I think it's 9.3, in the bill, you outline these specific safeguards attached to the use of those of those mechanisms. But how can we ensure that these will also apply to measures that are in relating to automated content moderation tools that are applied to um, harmful content? And so these were sort of my main um, two comments and perhaps a suggestion to clarify this perhaps in, um, in the recitals of, of this bill. I'll leave it at that, yeah. Thank you so much and thank you so much to all the panelists for your great input and the questions that you've raised. Um, we're running a, a bit out of time, so we don't have much time or we don't have any time left for a proper discussion with all of you. But this is a great moment for me to explain and repeat that today we launched our new website, My Content, My Rights, uh, of which the link you can find in the chat box of the live stream. And on this website, we are collecting your stories of unrightful takedowns, and we're also collecting comments there on the draft law that we have discussed today. So please don't hesitate to, uh, to go to our website and give more input. And I would uh, really like to give a big thank you again to um, the second panel. And I would like to give uh, now the floor to uh, my colleague, Patrick Breyer, who will give a summary of the second panel. Hi, Patrick. <laughs> I think you're muted. Is that possible? Hmm. I don't hear you, but that's maybe also because of me. Oh, I hear something now. Yes. Oh, and now you're gone again. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yes? Yes, yes, here you Okay, so great. Hi, everybody. This is Patrick uh, Breyer. I'm, I'm a member of the European Parliament for the German Pirate Party and um, used to be a privacy activist. I work on the Digital Services Act um, in the legal affairs and in the civil liberties uh, committees. And um, thank you to our experts for this reflection on the draft that we have put forward. Um, it is clear that this draft really is work in progress, right? So thank you very much for the comments you've given to us. And I would also like to point out that on the website that Kim pointed you to, um, the public is invited to also uh, comment on the draft and help us improve it. This is not the only draft. The um, uh, Legal Affairs Committee only today adopted its uh, proposal for a um, uh, content moderation regulation, basically, and that's worth looking at. So uh, if these drafts keep coming in, maybe some of you will start um, making a scoreboard to make sure that they contain all provisions that you believe are um, essential. Now, from most of you, um, we've actually heard um, the discussion of the issue of who should really be deciding on uh, which content is removed or whether content is illegal or not and um, how can we avoid unjustified um, content takedowns and that is indeed the the essence um, of the matter and um, the draft text doesn't fully address this yet it is clear that the platforms don't really have a commercial incentive to host fringe content and to fight for the freedom of expression of, of those who who upload it, which is a huge problem, that they are really only mostly interested in popular 
unproblematic mainstream content, um, but that doesn't reflect the diverse society that we uh, want to see, as Alexander said, to begin with. Um, Martin and Matthias suggested that we might want to differentiate by um, who is notifying um, infringements. So we might want to make a, a difference according to that. Uh, Gabrielle suggested that we might want to differentiate is this a violation of personal interests of private law or is this criminal content criminal content or um, is it supposed to violate terms and conditions so is it legal content that the platforms don't want to host because they consider it uh, harmful or for other reasons so i think what might be useful in, in respect to terms and conditions is to make sure that these comply with um, human rights with freedom of speech and that is why the DSA report by the Legal Affairs Committee, for example, says that the fairness of terms and conditions should be assessed by the courts. I think that's very important because you'll always have, uh, despite, despite all regulations, you'll always have a certain uh, room of uh, um, where the company their own their own decisions, and so the fairness of their rules really needs to be assessed. Martin and Thomas have also um, pointed out the fact that there should be an institutional framework. So beyond the notice and action procedure as such, there needs to need to be institutions to, to, to protect freedom of expression. And um, you mentioned, um, Martin, our suggestion to have an ombudsperson who could refer takedown decisions to review, even if it isn't the uploader themselves. And the idea of that suggestion is that uploaders will not, not have the capacity or knowledge to fight for their rights. And it could be, it could be a, a good idea to have an ombudsperson or a commissioner for freedom of speech, whatever is up to your discussion. Um, Thomas mentioned that it could have class, have class actions, so have NGOs basically uh, contest takedowns on behalf of the uploaders. That's also a, a very good idea. And um, finally, um, what I would like to recall is um, many of you agreeing that this notion of action procedure is only part of what is needed to protect the expression, expression online. There are many issues beyond that which are not covered by, by this draft in our discussion today. That Matthias mentioned the issue of upload filters, uh, which result in systematic overblocking of, of legal content. Um, there is the problem of content curation, so the algorithms that sort tasks and how users can be put in control of, of that content curation. And there is the issue of having centralized platforms at all, uh, rather than um, decentralized open networks, uh, federated networks. And that raises the idea of um, introducing interconnectivity to make these um, networks interoperable and open them up for real user choice. So there is a lot that is to be discussed in the context of the upcoming Digital Services Act. And um, I thank you for the input we've heard so far. And I look forward to all questions that our viewers will want, want to raise now. Thank you, Patrick. And indeed, we got quite a lot of questions. And unfortunately, we're running out of time. So I think we have one for each of us. Um, but let's let's get to it. And um, thank you so much for all the questions that were asked. And if you have any more questions, don't hesitate to uh, contact us through our hashtag, um, my content, my rights. So um, the first question, I will give this one to Marcel. Uh, is can the DSA deliver the transparency required to protect fundamental rights in the fight against hate speech and illegal content? Yeah, still uh, uh, really brief because we're really running out of time um, and we still have the closing remarks on this uh, whole event. Uh, but the short answer is yes, of course, this is a unique opportunity to introduce uh, rules to uh, introduce transparency that is required to address all these issues. Now, it's our duty to work uh, with the Commission um, to in, in order to have a, a good uh, outcome, to have, have a, um, a good legislation that helps us address all these issues and stay fair. 
Well, thank you. That was a, a quick answer. Um, then let's go to Patrick. Uh, a transparent notice and action procedure is definitely an improvement, but it still holds in place a system where online platforms control all content on the internet and act as policing agents. Shouldn't we lay the responsibility for content control elsewhere? Yes, that is very similar to the question that Gabrielle uh, raised. Um, who should be deciding what their content should be taken down and should really the platforms be in charge, which mostly means their um, contractors who are underpaid, often underqualified, they sometimes have five seconds to address a piece of content and we can't really expect high quality decisions on that. So. While it would be preferable uh, to have a court, for example, um, assess the issue, I don't think um, there is a majority to do that, especially in urgent cases, especially where content is manifestly and clearly and without dispute illegal. Um, you'll find an attempt of a definition in the jury report that was voted today, and we've tried to, to make it really narrow the issue of, of manifest content. Um, but I think in the end, um, there will be no majority to completely take this out of the hands of, um, of the platforms, unfortunately. And so what we can do is make sure that it will be possible to contest it, these issues and to have a high quality review and also hopefully change the, the structure of these networks to make sure that we're not so dependent on them as we are today. Thank you. And then the last question, which is for me, how should hate speech be regulated in the Digital Services Act? And will the punishment of excessive reporting discourage the victims of hate speech? Um, so I think that between hate speech and the freedom of expression, a uh, balance must be safeguarded. Hate speech should be illegal when hate speech publicly incites violence against individuals or groups of people, for example. And then as soon as it clear that content is illegal, it should be taken offline. But there should be clear rules on when something is hate speech and is illegal, because it should, in my opinion, not be up to online platforms to set our societal norms when gray areas appear in existing laws. So I think the task is really to ensure that there are clear laws on hate speech. I agree with the point that we should ensure punishment of excessive reporting should not victims of hate speech. And we know that's fine in here, as we heard also earlier in the discussion, because of content that is not a little but harmful. And um, I think um, something we, we have to continue looking at will definitely take this into account. Thank you. So I think that ends our discussion. I think we've all heard so many um interesting points today i'm very happy um that we had so many amazing speakers um and i'm very happy that i've uh, be, have been able to organize this together with the other meps working on this topic so thank you to you as well um so um thank you for your valuable input today we will definitely follow up with this very important topic and I would really like to thank the people that worked really hard behind the scenes to get this event and the website done. So thanks to Christian, our website magician, and the campaign working group, Myrthe, Esther, Amelia, and Kirsten, and also Jeroen for making sure that we were visible to you all today. Um, we wish you all a very great evening. Thanks for watching, and please go to our website to more from you, uh, what you've experienced and what you think we should European that your content will be um, based right. So that's what we're fighting for. <laughs>